My name is Ben Taylor. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon based out of Columbus, Ohio at Grant Medical Center. Uh, I've been doing rib fractures for about five years now, involved in about 170 cases thus far. Our initial surgeries involve significant large dissections with maximally invasive incisions. Over time, these continue to decrease, and what we found is that patient outcomes are significantly improved. By minimizing the iatrogenic injury of the muscles, we can switch from having the patients be significantly debilitated after surgery to being much more happy and able to actually return to work after surgery. In the videos to follow, you may see some large dissections, but if you look at the muscle sparing techniques we're utilizing, we're uh, paying careful attention to the muscle to minimize our damage. For a posterior lateral thoracotomy, the patient's placed in a lateral decubitus position. Uh, the shoulder in this video is right here with the arm extending anteriorly. Uh, prepping the arm free will allow you to manipulate the upper extremity, which will allow mobilization of the scapula in different planes with simple manipulation of the arm. Now, this is often recommended, especially if the wide area of injury is uh, uh, going to be accessed. For the approach here, the vertical limb of the incision here is halfway between the medial border of the scapula and the scapular spines. As this curves down, this turns into somewhat of a J as this continues down the posterior lateral aspect of the thorax. The inferior edge of the scapula is palpated and marked out as such. This will allow us to help determine where our incision needs to be. The spinous processes are here on that patient. So our vertical limb is going to go halfway or equidistant between this. And then our curve anteriorly is going to occur at what level we need to be. Typically at the inferior edge of the scapula with the arm in this position, this is usually around the seventh rib. So if we need to access more inferiorly, we can curve down here. If we don't need to access that far down, we can curve it usually about a centimeter to centimeter and a half below the tip of the scapula. So in this instance, we'll curve as such. Uh, what this will allow us to do is access all of the posterior as well as posterior lateral rib fractures. If we need to continue anteriorly into the axilla, we can continue with this line drawing as such. This will allow us to continue through the lateral aspect of the thorax and rarely, if needed, you can access the anterior hemithorax as well with a submammary approach. So in this instance, we'll do a full-on posterior lateral thoracotomy as so. Subcutaneous bleeding in these areas can be significant and hemostasis should be paid to uh, with electrocautery. Our goal here is to get down through the skin subcutaneous tissue into the fascia overlying the musculature. Give a rate. And with the posterior lateral thoracotomy, we are looking for the triangle of auscultation, uh, especially if using the muscle sparing technique we'll show here. The fascia is elevated. At the end of the procedure, this is tacked down with a large absorbable suture in order to minimize seroma formation. A drain is not typically necessary for these procedures. And the fascia is elevated only as needed for the fracture and injury pattern. In this instance, we'll create a large field uh, to improve visualization. At this point, uh, dissecting to this point, elevating the fascia, we can see our latissimus fibers running in this direction here. We can palpate the tip of the scapula here. And you actually see the latissimus is being folded over the inferior angle of the scapula. So this can be altered by changing the position of the arm if necessary. In this instance here, I'm just going to elevate the latissimus. Uh, typically, uh, if we get a free edge here, we can begin going in the bursa underneath this. In digital dissection or cob, blunt dissection can be performed. As we saw with some of the earlier dissection through the lateral aspect, this is a very open plane and significant access can be obtained uh, in this interval.
blunt dissection is most appropriate here. A small fascial band is seen here and can be cut. And at this time, we can see our triangle of auscultation, which will be our workhorse window for this procedure. Uh, this is bordered by your latissimus, uh, going laterally towards the humerus. We have our trapezius, more posteriorly, as well as midline. And then we have our scapula here as well. As you can see, even uh, at this point, I can elevate the scapula off of the body. Our serratus fibers are going to be entering on the inferior aspect and feeling the muscle belly of the subscapularis can be seen underneath as well. So we'll work in this interval here in this triangle. As we expand this, we'll be able to access much of the posterior lateral aspect of the thorax. Blunt dissection is uh, quite nice in these intervals here as we release some of the subscapular bursa. This is one of the bursas in the body that can have significant amount of adhesions. As we continue, as we look in here, we notice this is fairly wide open. There are several adhesions on the periphery of this which can be elevated or transected as needed. A larger attractor can be placed underneath here to provide some elevation. So we can see there's still several adhesions here which are limiting the movement and excursion of our scapula. These can also be transected. As we continue to look up here in the more superior aspect of our field, we notice that the adhesions tend to minimize out and actually this area is quite smooth. So now using this we have access to the entire subscapular region of the scapula. Again our intervals here, we have our latissimus fibers coming up towards the proximal humerus. We have our scapula and then we have our trapezius making the medial border of the triangle of auscultation. Working through this interval will allow you access to much of the posterior lateral uh, th thorax. If access is needed more anteriorly, this same approach can be used. And as we elevate the fascia off the anterior latissimus, we can begin working through this. If we need to go anterior enough, we can actually get on the front side of the latissimus muscle here and work on the anterior aspect of this. As we continue anteriorly, we can evaluate and use the interval behind our latissimus. We can come anterior to the latissimus if we extend this anteriorly enough, or we can actually transect and split the latissimus in the middle in line with its fibers in order to access the underlying thorax. Typically a pilot hole is created in the fascia, and this area is bluntly split in line with its fibers in order to access the underlying ribs. Blunt split of the latissimus will allow access to the underlying thorax for percutaneous fixation as needed. This allows for a more anterior window, which sometimes can make a separate incision or separate approach not necessary. Underneath the scapula, a significant bursa is seen. If difficulty is uh, encountered visualizing the ribs, some of this bursal tissue, which tends to be a bit foamy in nature, can be removed. And now we can see we have access to the posterior lateral thorax. And in fact, here's one of the ribs right here. Uh, and now we've encountered a rib fracture on the posterior lateral thorax. This is a uh, uh, in a relatively good position, but again can be adjusted with any of the instrumentation. The soft tissue from the fracture site is elevated, but the remainder of the periosteum and soft tissue around this is not elevated unless it is thick musculature. This provides a significant blood supply to the rib and will uh, and removal of the blood supply will unfortunately limit some of the union and delay things unnecessarily. If the plate is too long, we can use the plate cutters 
to shorten the plate to a length appropriate for the fracture. In this instance, we'll remove three screw holes plate is transected but still has fairly sharp edges. In this instance, the plate cutter has a diamond uh, recessed area here which can be used to provide manual grinding of the edge of the plate to provide a smooth surface. You should ideally keep this away from the open incision in order to minimize any small fragments of plate and going into the field. And the plate is double checked. If desired, the trocar from the in situ bender can be utilized as a joystick or holder for the plate to keep this into position. This allows hands free access to most of the plate and field, uh, which allows improved visualization. Uh, if needed, a supplementary incision along the inferior aspect of the rib or cephalad aspect of the rib can be created and the bayoneted forceps applied as so. This will help hold the position of the plate, but will also help hold the position of the rib fracture. The anterior aspect of the rib fracture can then be reduced and held into position as well using the bayoneted forceps. A screw can be placed into position here, but unfortunately as I try to access this rib, it is underneath the scapula and retractor, uh, collinearity of the screw cannot be obtained. In an instance such as this or in an area underneath the scapula, uh, the right angle screwdriver can be used. The right angle screwdriver is seen as here. Uh, this screwdriver should be inserted into the body perpendicular to the the final position here and then rotate it in. What this does is allow ease of access into the area and then twisting into position here. The end of this device is what drives the screw into position. One just needs to make sure that gentle downward pressure on the head is applied. Typically that can be done with one or two fingers on the shaft of the instrument. The screw is placed into the surgical field. Gentle downward pressure is applied onto the screw. The handle is turned and the screw begins to catch and in threading itself into the bone. Okay. Uh, at times the more lateral fractures are actually able to be uh, obtained and traditional straight screwdrivers can be used to uh, place these lateral screws. Again, a straight screwdriver can be used to place these if the 90 degree driver is not needed, as seen here. For areas underneath the scapula, the right angle screwdriver can be utilized. This should be placed perpendicular to the screw insertion and then turned into position. A gentle downward pressure is applied on the mid shaft of the handle and torque twist applied to the end. This will advance the screw into position. A final screw can be placed posteriorly. Again, one needs to make sure you're staying fairly perpendicular to the hole as you advance this to allow the locking mechanism to work final hand tightening with a manual screwdriver should be performed. Typically this involves anywhere from a quarter to a half turn uh, to achieve final tightening. Manual tightening with the right angle screwdriver uh, can be performed up here and as you can see here difficulty is obtained with getting the appropriate angle so final tightening with the straight screwdriver should not be performed. The a rib fracture is seen here using the posterior lateral thoracotomy utilizing the same triangle of auscultation.
as we continue more inferiorly here, the ribs here are easier to access. As we continued posterior, our trapezius is going to be in the way. Posteriorly, as we see here, our paraspinal musculature is going to come into play with uh, tendons running in a north-south direction as seen here. These muscles, if you need to go more posteriorly, should be elevated in mass and really not transected to minimize the risk of back pain. Uh, the rib here is evaluated. Uh, slight adjustments to reduction can be made. Yeah, it's kind of just leaning on it a little. The plate contour is evaluated. We'll use the handheld benders to bend the posterior rib plate down into position. And gentle bends are key. The soft tissue does not need to be fully elevated from this unless it's musculature. The thin fascia here can be maintained in position to avoid any additional bleeding. We can hold this into position. We can evaluate the position of the plate proximally and distally, and once happy with this, we can use our temporary transfixion screws. Once this is fully seated, you should take off the screwdriver handle, not over advance that to minimize stripping. Uh, as we can see, this is off of the bone still. So at this time, I can use another temporary screw to help bring this down to bone. Alternatively, a clamp can be applied. Being happy with the anterior aspect of this, I'm going to place several screws here. The temporary screw is removed and a purple screw placed into this hole. And I'll maintain this temporary screw into position here, which will help hold our reduction and minimize stress on the screws that are already in place until the final construct is finished. In situ benders are a several piece construct. These devices will screw into the plate and the teeth of this will help hold the plate as you apply any twisting or bending moment. Uh, of note, you need to make sure to place this into here before screwing into the plate, otherwise this won't work. One needs to make sure you don't have any soft tissue in the way, otherwise they won't screw in. In addition, if it's uh, having difficulty screwing this in, uh, back it off a half or quarter turn and it will end up uh, sitting in much nicer. These must be placed perpendicular in order to fully thread in. Using one area nearest the fracture as your post, this one must be held firm as we bend the other one into position here. A twisting moment can be applied. In addition, a bending moment can be applied. In this instance, I just need to bend this aspect of the plate down into position. I'm going for the end hole to get this down a little bit more flush. Now, after the bend is complete, I can remove these Alternatively, if this still wants to spring up, what I can do is I can use this as a manual tool to hold my plate down into position and just as needed. And placing a screw two holes away from this, this will help hold that into position. Now the tendency of this distal aspect of the plate to move is lessened significantly with placement of that screw. and a purple screw will be placed into the hole. So now to finish our construct, in this instance with such a long lever arm, I will use three screws in the posterior aspect as well as one to finish our construct. A little off axis there. And now his hand tightening is completed. With any segmental injury, three screws are needed on each side of the fracture. In an instance such as this, where the intercalated segment is small, three screws are placed posteriorly, three screws are placed anteriorly, and one single screw placed in that middle or intercalated segment. The closure of the posterior lateral thoracotomy is done in stages. The stretching of the muscle tissue can be significant at times, especially if accessing a wide breadth of this area. Uh, what I do is bring this together 
you know, loosely reapproximate with reabsorbable suture, which helps hold this into position and minimizes dead space. If you're using any local anesthetic or similar pumps, this can be placed prior to placement of the final closure. After that, the underlying fascia here, which may be stripped off significantly, is tacked back down to the muscle itself in order to minimize any post-operative seroma formation. A closed suction drain typically is not necessary. Um, during closure, the palpability of the plates can be evaluated with the overlying musculature and bringing these together and uh, leaving the triangle of auscultation open. These plates are found to be minimally palpable. So we hope you've enjoyed these videos and hopefully they've been helpful to you in your practice. Uh, in these videos, we've shown some of the dissections, including the muscle sparing techniques we're utilizing here. Again, we're doing these not for the short term, but for the long term, getting the patients out of the hospital, getting them back to real life and uh, healthy and happy as they can be.